<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mid Speeds Live class. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to mute everyone. All right, let's go ahead and get started with some common words. Here we go. Ready? Right to other more shall last like glad mad dear could work also must should there only same little matter give find sent who going school take new sir attention account kindly hope year first all right let's do some common phrases here we go must understand shall understand she understands should understand so he understands that he understand that he understands so i understand that i understand that you understand they understand to understand we understand what he understands what i understand what you understand what i understand when you understand when i understand where he understands where i understand where you understand whether he understands whether i understand whether or not he understands whether or not i understand whether or not you understand whether you understand which he understands which i understand which you understand who understands until the vice president voir dire can i want can want could you want can you want could want did i want do i want do you want does he want he wanted he wants I can't wait. I can't want. I didn't want. I don't want. All right. I have some short phrases and short sentences. Here we go. All right, ready? My new place. Most of the animals give it back. My last name. I know why. Mom says now I need help. Move over through the line. Kind of nice. Kind of the same. Same time tomorrow. Change your clothes the following day. Give it away. Show us around. The air is warm. Another old picture. Where in the world? Put it there. I'm an American. My home is large right now. This must be it. Home sweet home. The men ask for help. You must be right. Get to the point. Help me out. It's your place. Read the book. All right, let's move into consonant compounds. Here we go. The prince presumed the problems had all been presented. Priorities are our primary protests. While printing or praying, we must promote the prophesier. Proceed to the private premises. The press room was buzzing with presidential primary results. Owning property is the downfall of the proletarian. Practice your pronunciation with the proper diction. Predestination is the presumption that our lives are predetermined. The preconception that all progress is present day is pragmatic. Prankish tricks often precede the practical person. Prohibit your procession if pregnancy prohibits it. Procure the promotion if the printer is presentable. He has a propensity to project the pro rata data. The priceless prescription is presumed to be lost. The pro provocative protege let her presence permeate the precious press room. 
show the proprietor the proper protocol. Prose is writing with preferable precision. Practice what you preach and don't always preach what you practice. Now, these are going to focus on initial PL. She used plastic plates and platters. The platform was not plated. A plateau was planned. Blood platelets are a plus. We looked at a plate full of plastic. A platinum blonde is pleasing. Platitudes are not pleasant. Ours was a platonic affair. Their platoon played with a platypus. The plaudits were not plausible. They pleaded to play in the plaza. He based his plea on the pleat. A play by the plenary council was planned. Players don't wear plaid pleats. Your pledge will plenish us. Pleurisy affects the pleura. It was not only plenty, it was a plethora. A plotter's plight is plumpness. The plumber plunged the plunger. You may act as my playing planner. All right, last one. This focuses on initial consonants, PL as well. Placards were plastered in each plot. She placated him with a pleasant placebo. You can place the plain plan here. Don't get out of place on the plane. We have plenty. Take the placement test. The placer was placid placing the plants. Why does a player plagiarize the plans? Plagues are not plotted or planned. The plaintiff wore a plain plaid. Our plantation pleased the planners. Pluto is a planet. Use a plane to smooth the plank. Planishing hammers level metal plates. The plastic plant used a plumber. A planter wart requires plastic surgery. Don't put planter's punch in a planter. Place the plaque in the plaster. The plasma pleased the plower. Some call a plot a plat. The platters were plotters. All right. Moving on to tingle tamers. Here we go. Behavior modification, louver draperies, paraplegic equipment, fresh architecture, striking impression, illegal immigrants, covered porches, sensitive statement, unusual friendships, high profile, swayed precariously, beleaguered correspondence, sense and sensibility, outpatient facilities, terribly confusing, colorless environment, foreign secretaries, home builder extraordinaire. Names along with ages. We started this yesterday and we're going to finish it today. I'm going to sp be spelling the last name. I have allergies today again, so my eye is watering, so I apologize. All right, here we go. Doug Naylor, N A Y L O R 62. Alan Wren, W R E N 65. Emily Pankhurst. P-A-N-K-H-U-R-S-T, 10. Andrew Hall, H-A-L-L, -L, 50. Fee Plumley, P-L-U-M-L-E-Y, 98. Allie Rourke, R -O -U -R -K -E, R-O-U-R-K-E, 6. Gary Moundfield, M-O-U-N-F-I-E-L-D, 56. Andy Williams, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S, 13. George Garrett, G-A-R-R-E-T-T, -T, 
74. Anthony Burgess, B-U-R-G-E-S-S, -S, 27. Harold Lever, L-E-V-E-R, 87. Arthur Delaney, D-E-L-A-N-E-Y, 91. Amy Harden, H-A-R-D-E-N, 32. Holiday Granger, G-R-A-I-N-G-E-R, 12. Howard Jacobson, J-A-C-O-B-S-O-N, 101. Benjamin Haywood, H-E-Y-W-O-O-D, 45. Ian Brown, B-R-O-W-N, 16. Bernard Manning, M-A-N-N-I-N-G, 86. Ivan Curtis, C-U-R-T-I-S, 23. Brandy Summer, S-U-M-M-E-R, 24. Ryan Shane, S-H-A-N-E, 35. J.J. Thompson, T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N, 47. Brenda Kidd, K-I-D-D, -D, 12. All right. Now here are some words that start with X. Here we go. Ex-convict, ex-wife, ex-nurse, ex-officer, ex-preacher, ex-employee, ex-mayor, ex-teacher, ex-president, ex-employer, ex-marine, ex-student, ex-husband, ex-governor, ex-president, ex-salesman, ex-soldier. All right, now these words all start <clears throat> with N, E-N. Here we go. Entrap, entrenched, enable, enlist, enact, enliven, enacted, encase, enrapture, encircle, enrich, encircled, enriching, enslave, enclose, encode, ensnare, entangle, entrust, endanger, enthrone, entitle, endear, entomb, enfold, entrance, enforce, entrap, engage, engaged, enjoin, enjoy, enlarge, entrenched, entrust, entrusted, envision. That would be a good drill to go back after the class and add any words that didn't show up in your dictionary. Just add those to your dictionary. All right. I'm going to give you an and, an, a drill. I'm first going to give you some phrases and then move on to the sentences. Here we go. A pig, a box, a cap, an error, an issue, an otter, ham and eggs, red and white, rain and snow, a case, a test, a cart, an extra, an infant, an ending, black and blue, peaches and cream, height and weight, a pal, a tab, a pot, an alibi, an altar, an onset, cats and dogs, old and gray, run and jump, a desk, a turn, a plan, an alley, an eagle, an emblem, Jack and Jill, twist and turn, thick and thin, 
a man, a fin, a gal, an ulcer, an idiot, an ideal, tall and dark, old and worn, Dick and Jane, a scar, a drum, a sign, an outing, an orphan, an oyster, fits and starts, sixes and sevens, loyal and true, a sin, a job, a bag, an agent, pen and paper, an extra, coat and hat, a book, a boy and girl, a sale, a fake, an escape, knife and fork, an afghan, hand and foot, an equity, cup and saucer, use a knife and a fork, an inch turns into a mile, I've a dog and a cat, wear a coat and a tie, eat an apple and an orange, sit and read a book, wear a coat and a tie, eat an apple and an orange, take a coat and hat, it's a day and a half, a bus and an auto crashed, use a day and a half, Go get a paper. Use a paper and pencil. Use an apple and an apricot. An apple, or excuse me, an annual picnic is a lark. Tom and I ate the apple. Use an hour and a half. Wear an overcoat and boots. It's a, it's a tan and blue color. I've got some common questions. These are different common questions. Okay, all right. And I'm going to use the light board um, because some of them are for, from the plaintiff, some are from defense, and some are from the court. Okay, but they're just, there's no answers, just questions. Okay, all right. Here we go. Were there any warning cones or devices, construction, jersey barriers, anything of that nature in the street within a hundred yards of the intersection at the time of the incident? At the time of the accident, were there any lights at that intersection as far as overhanging street lights to eliminate the intersection at the time of the accident? Are there any directional signals or lights at that intersection? Before the accident occurred, do you recall seeing any vehicles cross in front of your path? What was the speed limit at or near the intersection at the time of the accident. Just before you applied your brakes before the accident, can you give us your best estimate as to your approximate speed? Did you have your headlights on at the time of the accident? Did you notice at any point in time before or after the accident that the car that you were involved with in the collision also had their headlights on? Were your turn indicators on at the time of the accident? Are you aware of any witnesses to the accident? Were there witnesses to this accident? Was a police report filed? To your knowledge, was any police report made for this incident? Are you aware of any reports being made to any authority because of this incident? All right.
And then um, if you don't already know this, the brief for incident is S-D-E-N-T. Okay, let's do some literary. This article, it's a funny article. It's called Me Go Now. Before you give your boss a piece of your mind, make sure you can spare it. <laughs> kind of a funny one. All right. Here we go. I'm going to start this at 120. I will work my way to 160. Okay. All right. Ready? In the advertising agency where I work as a copywriter, the word has long since gone around that I am vaguely daffy. It's true that I become involved in impossible situations and rarely say what I mean. Things have worsened steadily since Glenn Gordon came in as creative head of our agency. The first time Glenn ever saw me was the day Gregory Peck toured our offices, gathering background for an acting role. At the moment, I was in the art department waiting for an artist friend to return from lunch, sitting at a drawing board, idly drawing rectangles. I suddenly looked up to see Glenn Gordon, Gregory Peck, and other important folk filing in. Sizing up the situation quickly, I did what I maintain was the right thing. Glenn Gordon was there to show Mr. Peck artists. I became one. I drew rectangles furiously. This is what we call the bullpen, Glenn said. Here are rough ideas. I'm sorry, here our rough ideas are rendered into finished layouts to show our clients. He smiled at the artist in the bullpen. He smiled at me. Gregory Peck smiled at me. I smiled back. As soon as they left, I decided not to wait around for the artist any longer. I texted for him to call me, took a shortcut to my office, and started writing up a draft from my computer. Shadows fell across my opaque glass cubicle. Voices murmured. I looked up appalled. There were Glenn Gordon, Gregory Peck, and the others. This is a typical copywriter's office, Glenn began. Here, basic copy is, he stared at me and his mouth hung open caught on a syllable. I smiled at him. I smiled at Peck. The group moved on and I returned to my work, but my heart wasn't in it. I knew with a dread certainty that Glenn and I would meet again. A week later, a secretary had her purse stolen, presuming it taken by a transient messenger and hoping at least to recover the bag, she asked me to search the trash can in the men's room. I went in and began looking through the big basket. Glenn Gordon entered. It didn't occur to me that he had no idea why I was examining crumpled paper towels in the laboratory of a hundred million dollar advertising agency. I saw it only as a good time to explain the Peck incident. I rose up from the trash and said, about Gregory Peck, I wasn't twins the other day. I was in the art department to see about cutting up some horses. It didn't come out right as usual, but I had been there that day to get some photos of horses trimmed and mounted. Glenn backed away slowly, nodding at me. After that, things went smoothly until the day we came face to face in the production department. Glenn motioned me to a chair. 
Obviously, he needed to know more about me, and wonderfully enough, I was equal to the occasion. We chatted easily about a variety of things. As we talked, Glenn became visibly relieved. I decided to quit while I was ahead. I stood up quickly and leaned toward Glenn to say goodbye. A simple so long or nice talking with you would have sufficed. But as I searched for the appropriate farewell, my mind gave way completely. No words came. Glenn, having no inkling that I meant to leave and unable to understand why I was suddenly towering over him silently, froze like a frightened rabbit. My mouth began to move wordlessly. Finally, I managed to speak. Me go now, I said hoarsely and walked away. Why I said that had an explanation, but it's the kind that never can be given without adding to the confusion. I had been reading about Robert Benchley, once attending a bad play involving a character who spoke broken English. Benchley had said, me go, and left the theater. The phrase stuck in my subconscious until it tumbled out to help do me in. Soon there was another incident, the time 4.20 p.m. of a hectic day. I had just escaped from a meeting and was heading for the 10th floor and the sanctuary of my own office. The elevator door opened and there naturally was Glenn Gordon. He smiled resolutely and said, hi there, how are you? I stepped aboard and answered, hi, just getting back from lunch? If you were to convene all the authors of all the articles on how to succeed in business and ask them to select the one phrase not to be uttered to the boss at 20 past four in the afternoon, just getting back from lunch would score victory by acclamation. Do believe me, that isn't what I meant to say. Exactly what I meant to say, I do not know. That was Tuesday. Wednesday was worse. I took a late lunch and celebrated a crisp winter day in Manhattan by buying my fiance a huge stuffed poodle. On my way back, I saw a pair of earrings I thought she would like and bought those too. When I returned to my desk, I had a clever idea. I decided to put the earrings on the dog's ears and thus give both presents an original touch. I unwrapped the big poodle and hoisted it up onto my desk. Carefully, I began fastening a silver bell-shaped earring to a floppy ear. Fate was tempted. Fate responded. As I bent to my task, Glenn Gordon came down the aisle and glanced in my office. Everywhere about me, dedicated copywriters, or excuse me, everywhere about me, dedicated copywriters were hard at work. But there I was putting earrings on a stuffed poodle. I grinned at Glenn and said, dog. He stared open, he stared, opened his mouth to speak and then rushed away. I have not seen him since. I start each day with trepidation, waiting for a pink slip to flutter in. What will I say then? Me go now, I guess. Pretty funny article. All right. Let's do some opening statements. And I apologize. Got allergies. My eye has been watering today. Okay, let's go ahead and do some opening statements. Here we go. You need to know how each little piece of evidence in this two week trial is going to fit into the big picture is going to fit into whether or not Ian Thomas is guilty of the three offenses 
for which he has been charged. I have told you, and you know, and most of you, in fact, I think all of you, have indicated in your questionnaires that you were at least somewhat familiar with the Kyle Matthews case, but you didn't hear the evidence in that case. Now, some of that evidence, as I mentioned, may or may not be contested, but because of the importance of this case, it is still necessary to tell you the whole story. It is necessary to explain all the physical evidence, as well as the evidence that may be directed towards Ian Thomas, and some of that evidence, again, will be physical evidence, and some are going to be statements. We intend to tell you about all of that, certainly, during this opening statement and during this process. The judge told you that Mr. Thomas has been charged with three separate offenses, first degree of intentional homicide, mutilating a corpse, and first degree sexual assault. He told you the elements, that is, what it is the state has to prove, and we certainly intend to do that in this case. All right, the first legal concept that I want to talk to you about is the party to the crime. The judge has instructed you that a party to the crime is a concept or a form of criminal liability that is committed either when somebody commits a crime themselves or when they aid and abet the commission of the crime. Now, this is the law. Judge Mock will tell you what the law is. So whether you think this is a good idea or a bad idea, it's the law and you have to follow this law. And so the description or the explanation of, as an example, what aiding and abetting means is important for all of you to know. The judge has told you that a defendant can aid and abet the commission of a crime if he assists somebody who commits it, or importantly, what you might hear in this case, as the evidence may show in this case quite a bit, is that the individual in this case, Ian Thomas, stood ready and willing to assist, and that the actor in this case, Kyle Matthews, was an individual who knew of Ian's willingness to aid and abet, all right? Now I'm telling you that this early, excuse me, now I'm telling you that this early in the case because this is an important concept. It's important for you to understand what the criminal liability is. And again, whether you agree with or don't agree with that concept, with the concept of a party to the crime, it's something the judge tells you that you have to accept and you have to adopt. I'm going to introduce to you a lovely young woman. This is Haley Mears. Ms. Mears was 25 years old on Halloween of 2005. You are going to hear the evidence in this case that Ms. Mears was single, that Ms. Mears was a college graduate. Ms. Mears was a freelance photographer. She was a daughter, she was a sister, she was a friend, and she had her whole life ahead of her. You are also going to hear the evidence that all of that came to an end on Halloween of 2005. This story, this case, begins at about 8.12 a.m. on Halloween day of 2005, when the plan was set into motion to take this young woman's life. The plan was set into motion to rape and to kill and to mutilate this 25-year-old innocent young woman. The investigation of this case begins when we learn that Ms. Mears was reported missing on Thursday, the 3rd of November, 2005. She was a photographer. One of her contracts, one of the reasons that she was a photographer, 
was she worked for a magazine. She worked for something called Auto Trader Magazine, which is a magazine that sells cars. It has about, excuse me, it has ads about the cars and it requires photographers to go out and to take pictures of those cars. And so learning about Ms. Mears or learning how she worked for Auto Trader Magazine, it is important for you to understand about the investigation because you will learn that the investigation or at least the missing persons investigation determined that the last place that Ms. Mears was on the 31st was a place called the Matthew Salvage Yard. This is a place located here in Smith Rock in a place called the town of Libbing. It is a rural Smith Rock. It's kind of in the northern edge of Smith Rock, but it's a junkyard, a salvage business that has junked cars. And the other determination early on in this case was that a man by the name of Kyle Matthews made an appointment at 812 that morning to have Ms. Mears come to the residence or to come to that property, which was the Matthews salvage property. Now, I've alluded a little bit earlier about the case against Kyle Matthews, and you first need to know about the case against Kyle Matthews, the investigation that pointed toward Kyle Matthews being involved in this case. You may already know, and many of your jury questionnaires told us that you knew, at least some of the things about this man, about Kyle Matthews, that he had achieved some degree of notor notoriety in 2003 when he was exonerated, when he was released from prison back in 1985 for sexual assault. You may know that Mr. Matthews, or you'll hear in this case, that Mr. Matthews was exonerated or set free because of something called DNA evidence, because there was some DNA evidence from the 1985 case that didn't match his. All right, let's move into Q&A. We're going to start off with a with a an easier one and move our way into more challenging material. We're going to start off with our dog bite case. All right. So it looks like this one um, starts with defense. Okay, and again, I apologize for my allergies. Here we go. We're going to start at 120 and we're going to work our way to 160. Ready? Oh, excuse me. Defense. Here we go. What type of playing did you do with honey? Tug of war. Did you throw a ball? Did honey chase a ball? Yeah. Did you ever chase after honey? No. Did you ever play with lace after the? Yeah. When was the first time? About a month. Before the dog bite, did you play anything else besides baseball? No. What did your brothers and you do for fun other than playing baseball before the dog bite? We would wrestle and play catch. Did you do any of that after the dog bite? No. Never ever again? No. How come? I don't know. Could you have if you wanted to? Maybe. Do you get along with your brothers? No, not all the time. You like your brothers, right? Yeah. When you move to Texas in your new school, do you have recess there too? Yeah. What did they do during recess? Nothing, they just play. 
Do you play with them? Not all the time. What type of play do you do when you play during recess in Texas? I play on the playground. Is that like climbing up and down things and running around? Yeah, yes. Did you think much about the dog bite? Either you got the cast, or excuse me, after you got the cast off of your leg? No, no, nope. Did your brothers treat you any differently after the dog bite? No. After you got your cast off? No. After they took the stitches out of your leg? Yeah. Did you still feel any pain in your leg? Yes. Yeah. A little. Did it ever completely go away? No. So even today, you still feel some pain? Yeah. In your leg? Since they took the stitches out, is the pain staying the same or is it going up or going down? Going down. Do you always feel the pain in your leg? No. Are there times when you feel it and sometimes when you don't? Yeah, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Do you ever notice if anything causes you to feel the pain in your leg? No. When you do feel the pain, how long does it last? For about a day or two. And then how long is it gone there before it actually comes back? I don't know. Say within the last month, how often have you felt the pain in your leg? Like, like every three days. How long does it last for? For about two days. Is it constant for that two day period? Yeah. If we say 10 is the most pain that you've ever felt in your leg and zero is no pain at all, how would you rate the pain that you feel now? About eight, about an eight. So it's almost as much as it was at the point when it hurt you the most. Yeah. Do you do anything for it when you feel the pain? No. Sometimes my mom gives me Tylenol or something. Does it ever prevent you from doing any kind of activities? Not really. Sometimes. So you are able to do everything that you would normally do? Only sometimes. So are there some things that you can't do because of the pain? Yeah, what is that? Like run. Okay, during that summer after the dog bite, did you wear shorts? Yeah, did anybody ever say anything to you about your dog bite? Yes, any other parents or kids? Yes, okay, would they just ask you? Yeah, like what happened there? Okay, other than your family members and any doctors that you've seen, has anybody else ever said anything about your leg or, well, I don't know, just when they see the scars, they say, how did that happen? So people have asked you how it happened. Yeah, what do you tell them? I say, I got bit by a dog. How does that make you feel when they ask you, how did that happen to your leg? I don't know. Does it still bother you at all? No. Do you still have some scars on your legs? Yes. Do those bother you? Only sometimes when people touch them, it does. What happens when people touch them? It's like it stings. I'm sorry, I missed the last word. It stings. Stings, okay, S-T-I-N-G-S. -S. Oh, stings, okay, like bee stings? Yes. Does the scar seems to be, does it seem to be going away? No. Is it still the same as if it was right after they took the cast off? Yes. 
I don't believe I have any further questions at this time. Thank you, David. Do you want to go ahead with the questioning or take a break? I'd rather finish today with David before we take a lunch break, if we can. Do they have a jungle gym at your school in Texas? Yes. Do you climb on it? Yeah. Are you going to ask? Go ahead. Okay, I have just a few. Have you ever been bitten by any other dog? No. Has Max ever tried to bite you? No. How about any of your other dogs like Chubby? Only when they're playing, like they bite my arm, only when they're playing. Okay, that was before the dog bite accident we're talking about here today. After. After? Yeah. How many times has Chubby bitten your arm? About once or twice. Has he ever broken the skin? No. How did you feel when Chubby bit your arm? Nothing. Were you scared? No. How about Lace? Has Lace ever bitten you? Yeah, they only bite me when we're playing. And how many times were you playing when Lace bit you? Twice. And that was after the, the dog bite incident? Yes. Were you scared when Lace bit you? No. How about with Honey? Has Honey ever bitten you? Yeah. How many times? Once. Was that after the dog bite? Yes. And do you remember where? Do you remember where on your body? On my arm. Did Honey break the skin? No. Did she bite you any time? You stated before that there was a period of time where you were afraid of Honey. Is that correct? Yes. Was this the one incident where you were playing with Honey? Was that during that one time you were afraid of her? No. Was that after? Yeah. How about with Max? Did Max ever bite you? No. Did you ever play with Max? Yeah. Okay, how about after the July 1st dog bite? Yeah. Was there a period of time that you didn't play with Max? Uh-huh. What period of time was that? when I had my cast on. Okay, was that just, was it difficult to play with Max with your cast? Yeah, and then after that, did you play with Max? Yes. How about with anybody else's dogs after this July 1st? No, you haven't played. I've never played with anybody's dogs. Is there a reason why? Because I'm still afraid of dogs. All right, so we got to 160 with that. I'm going to switch transcripts for just a few more minutes, and then we will um, do some read back. All right, this is a little bit more difficult. Just a few more minutes. This is gonna be defense questioning. Here we go. Would you understand that to mean that two preliminary reports were somehow given to Brandt? Yes. What does it say below that? It says T-O for maps. Okay, T-O for maps. What does that mean to you? There was no map submitted with the report, and they're asking me to get them for them. What about that? How do you feel about that? Excuse me? Well, what about that entry causes you to feel that they are asking you to do anything? T.O. represents title officer. Okay, all right. Now, do you recall seeing this particular entry, having seen this in December of 2010? I see them every day. So you don't have any particular recollection about this one, is that correct? Right. Let me ask you. Do you have any recollection about, any recollection from December of 2010 of dealing with the December 9, 2010 packet? Well, yes. Okay. Yes. And the question is, do you remember dealing? Do you remember this? Yes, I do. What do you remember doing in connection with this particular title search or title preliminary report? 
nothing other than it being presented to me today. So as you sit here today, you don't have any memory of dealing with this packet, the December 9 packet in December of 2010, other than seeing it, this is the first time I've seen it since that point in time, yes. Okay, having seen it, does it refresh your memory that you actually saw it in December of 2010? Yes. Do you recall functioning as a title officer in connection with this packet in 2010? Yes. Do you recall what, if anything, you did in that capacity in December of 2010? Compiling a search as requested by Mr. Brandt, yes. You recall compiling a search? Oh, a searcher compiling it and reviewing it for the submission to Mr. Brandt. That means you recall reviewing it, is that correct? Yes. Let me make you understand. Sitting here today, you remember in December what you did in that December in reviewing it. The sequence of events in the actual physical reviewing, that means do you actually remember going through it? No. So sometimes people, they say or feel they remember something because they know they did it, all right? So we're actually trying to delineate, if possible, between what you actually remember and what you believe you did based on what is in front of you. Do you understand? Yes. That's why I'm asking you, what do you actually remember, if anything, concerning this title search in December of 2010? just the uniqueness of it as far as an appraisal. Okay, what do you mean by that? The uniqueness as far as an appraisal. Just that Mr. Brandt was wanting to report a report to be issued with the possible policy to be issued, not knowing the excessive value of the land and he submitting to my company an independent appraisal of the company. So you recall feeling something was unique about that in December, is that correct? Yes, it's very seldom somebody doesn't know property values in Orange County. Is there anything else about Mr. Brandt or the appraisal that you consider unique? No. Do you recall reviewing the title information that the searcher provided to you in December of 2010? No. Do you recall any of the thinking process or decision-making process that you went through to finally approve the preliminary title report in December of 2010? No. Does the fact that you have the packet in front of you at all refresh your memory and assist you in recalling anything that you've previously said you can't recall? No. Let's continue in our description of Exhibit A. In the lower left corner, there is a term account. And then there is a series of letters or numbers. What do they mean? What is significant by what's written there? That represents the area searched by the searcher. Why don't we give you the good copy and he can look at the original? That's fine with me. All right, let's stop there and we'll do some read back. All right. Okay, so the first take I'm going to do will be at uh, 160, then I'll read it again at 140, and then the last time at 120. Okay. All right. Here we go, and it looks like defense is questioning on this one. Here we go. At that time, were you employed by the state? I was employed by the state. In what capacity were you employed? State traffic controller. So that your job classification as of the time of the events that are the subject of this lawsuit was the same now as except that you were working out of a different office. Is that correct? That's correct. 
on that date, were you driving a black and white vehicle? No, I was not. What were you driving? I wasn't driving. What were you doing? I was riding as a passenger. And in what kind of vehicle? A marked highway patrol vehicle. A black and white vehicle? Yes. And were you on duty at that time? I was. Do you remember the identification number on the vehicle that you were driving at that time? I don't recall the number. What was the type of tour of duty you were on? On the graveyard shift? That's the time. What was the type? Were you on enforcement or what? Routine patrol. Now, can you describe basically what routine patrol consists of? It consists of monitoring the freeways for our vehicle code violations, assisting the motoring public. Motoring traffic for vehicle code violations? Yes. And you said you were assisting traffic in what manner? Disabled motorists. Anything else that is part of routine patrol that you can think of? No. All right, let's do that again at 140. All right, here we go. At that time, were you employed by the state? I was employed by the state. In what capacity were you employed? State traffic officer. So that your job classification as of the time of the events that are the subject of this lawsuit was the same as now, except that you were working out of a different office. Is that correct? That's correct. On that date, were you driving a black and white vehicle? No, I was not. What were you driving? I wasn't driving. What were you doing? I was riding as a passenger. And in what kind of vehicle? A marked highway patrol vehicle. A black and white vehicle? Yes. And were you on duty at that time? I was. Do you remember the identification number on the vehicle that you were driving at that time? I don't recall the number. What was the type of tour of duty you were on? On the graveyard shift? That's the time. What was the type? Were you on enforcement or what? Routine patrol. Now, can you describe basically what routine patrol consists of? It consists of monitoring the freeways for vehicle code violations, assisting the motoring public. Monitoring traffic for vehicle code violations? Yes. And you said you were assisting traffic. In what manner? Disabled motorists? Anything else that is part of routine patrol that you can think of? No. All right, let's do it one last time at 120. Here we go. At that time, were you employed by the state? I was employed by the state. In what capacity were you employed? State traffic officer. So that your job classification as of the time of the events that are the subject of this lawsuit was the same as now, except that you were working out of a different office. Is that correct? That's correct. On that date, were you driving a black and white vehicle? No, I was not. What were you driving? I wasn't driving. What were you doing? I was riding as a passenger. And in what kind of vehicle? A marked highway patrol vehicle. A black and white vehicle? Yes. And were you on duty at that time? I was. Do you remember the identification number on the vehicle that you were driving at that time? I don't recall the number. What was the type of tour of duty you were on? On the graveyard shift. That's the time. What was the type? Were you on enforcement or what? Routine patrol. Now, can you describe basically what routine patrol consists of? 
It consists of monitoring the freeways for vehicle code violations, assisting the motoring public. Monitoring traffic for vehicle code violations? Yes. And you said you were assisting traffic. In what manner? Disabled motorist. Anything else that is part of routine patrol that you can think of? No. All right, so since we don't have any students in the live class, um, there's really no reason for me to go back and read it. All you have to do is go to the take that you want to read back, whether it be 160, 140, or 120, listen to that take and compare it to your notes. All right, so that concludes our Mid Speeds live class. Have a wonderful day.